to With Love and Rage from Extinction Rebellion, New York City. In this episode, Carolyn interviews Dr. Elizabeth Sowen, co-director and co-founder of the Climate Interactive Think Tank. Thanks for tuning in. What we'd like to do is talk to you about the science, about where we stand right now with with global warming and the various projections and what that could mean for humanity. And then talk a bit about multi-solving. Sort of the rubric for it is tell the truth, which is really explain to people as cogently as, as we can where we stand with climate. Okay. But before we do that, do you want to just introduce yourself and say what Climate Interactive is and and what your professional sort of expertise is? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So my name is Dr. Elizabeth Sawin, and I'm the co-director and co-founder of Climate Interactive. And Climate Interactive is an organization that builds computer simulations of climate change and related issues, everything that climate touches or much that climate touches, things like health and equity and well-being and food and resilience and sea level rise. We build uh, really fast, really user-friendly simulations that are aimed at everyone from decision makers and leaders and elected officials to citizens, activists, middle school teachers, middle school students. So that's one unique thing about us is the the sort of range of people who find our tools useful. And generally what they do is they're grounded in the best available science. We're not a research group, so we're not doing new climate science. What we're doing is capturing the insights from all the great science out there and making it available to people. Our website, if folks are interested in trying this out for themselves, we always encourage that, is climateinteractive.org. And uh, you advised the UN at one point, uh, didn't you? Were you at one of the COP conferences? Yeah, our team tends to send at least a few people each year to the UN climate conferences. We're less involved in directly advising the UN and more helping the world really understand the the implications um, of the conversations that go on at, you know, the negotiations that go on at the COP. For many years, we were known for helping add up the pledges that different governments would make in terms of their percent reductions. We were one of the first groups that had the analytic ability to add up all those pledges and say, if each country did what they said they were going to do, how close would that come to meeting goals like the the Paris Agreement goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees. The good news is that now there's a whole bunch of research groups around the world who do that same analysis. So we've focused our resources more lately on this niche of helping people really understand, and people we mean global society, so journalists, leaders, citizen activists, really understand what are the solutions what is the package of solutions? Because as you probably know, it's not just one thing we need to do. We need to work across energy and food and agriculture and transportation. And the second thing we really focus on we call multi-solving, which is bringing to the foreground um, what many people know, but what we don't often take into account in our decision making, that a lot of what we need to do to protect the climate for the long term also has benefits for people's health and well-being or for biodiversity or for other forms of sustainability and resilience in the short term. So we help we help people um, understand what some of those multiple benefits are and also how to how to organize themselves as systems in order to go about solutions in ways that capture as many of those co-benefits as possible. Yeah, I want I want to talk more more about multi-solving later, you know, with some of the concrete examples that that you have. So I've read recently that scientists, most recently, are thinking that we're heading for probably around three degrees Celsius within a few decades. Can you talk about where we're heading and what that means and translate it into Fahrenheit, too, for people who who don't really uh, go by Celsius, which is most of most Americans. Yeah. So maybe the first thing to just start with the 
the basics is usually when people talk about uh, temperature increase, what they're referring to is an increase in the global average temperature relative to the sort of pre-industrial time. Um, and so when the Paris Agreement says well below two degrees centigrade, they're talking about two degrees increase over pre-industrial temperatures. Roughly, we've at this point already experienced around one degree centigrade of increase. Our model that, that we've developed at Climate Interactive is called En-ROADS. And when we use the assumptions that we think are reasonable about sort of a no action scenario, if the, if the global community doesn't um, take ambitious climate action, we tend to think about four degrees of increase by the end of the century, by 2100 in, in centigrade. And that's a little bit more than seven degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people. If you think about just annual fluctuations in temperature in my part of the world in the northern hemisphere, but it's important to remember this is a, a global average of a really big earth with a huge ocean that is very kind of stable, doesn't want to change very much or very fast. And so in the historical record, this is a much faster change in global average temperature than certainly in the in recent uh, human history, for sure. And it looks now as if the as if trying to hold it to under two two degrees is just out no longer realistic. That's not happening. No, I don't think I would agree with that. You can find people who say that, but really, when you get into this territory of what's realistic. At some point, you're talking less about the science of the climate and more about your expectations about politics and civil society and transformational change. And so we, we try in our modeling, we're very rigorous when it comes to how does the climate work? How does the carbon cycle work? How does sea level rise work? There's clear physical limits for all of those. There's also clear physical limits. You know, you can only replace vehicles at a certain rate and there's physical limitations about the rates of change of technology. But even incorporating all of those physical limits in the earth and all of those re sort of reasonable assumptions about the change in the global energy system, we still uh, can see scenarios that are well below two degrees. They would take action starting almost immediately. They would take action coordinated across the whole world. We couldn't leave any region behind. It would take action across all the sectors. You couldn't say, ignore transportation and focus on everything else or ignore food and agriculture and focus on everything else. But within those constraints, I would say, you know, starting now, focusing everywhere, doing a, a seriously ambitious effort being below two degrees is still physically possible. Well, that's good news. I think to get back to what you were saying before, you know, seven degrees may not sound like that much, uh, given that we all experience that every year with the changing of the seasons. But what humans can adapt to, plants and insects and other parts of the biosphere might not be able to. Can you talk about what a rise of, say, four degrees means to our food systems, to drought in many places in the world, and to extinctions? Yeah, well, I would have people start thinking about what we're already experiencing around the world with around one degree centigrade of temperature increase. And I probably don't have to go through that whole list, but we know about stronger storms. We know about fires in the West in the United States and fires currently in Australia. So we already know that a pretty small increase in global average temperature is already creating conditions that both human systems and natural systems are having increasing trouble coping with. And of course, one of the other challenging things about global change is that in our systems language, we say it's it's not necessarily linear. That means that adding one more degree doesn't necessarily mean adding the same amount of disruption because of things like threshold effects and feedbacks. You can actually have more disruption for the, 
the next degree that you add and even more for the next one. You know, there's a growing body of research that tries to paint a picture of what, say, four degrees of warming might look like. But when I look around the world at the the suffering, you know, particularly of people who've done the least to cause climate change historically, you know, the poorest people in the world, it seems like there's already sufficient reason to act as much as we possibly can. And being able to predict precisely what four degrees or 3.5 degrees might look like, you know, first, it's hard to, to be incredibly specific about it. And, and secondly, it seems like we already have clear reason to act, if that makes sense. Yeah. A lot of Westerners, though, feel that they won't be affected. You know, they think, well, I don't live near the ocean and, uh, you know, my country just isn't going to be feeling it. Uh, can you talk about how it will affect everyone? Well, of course, it won't affect everyone uniformly. And we know that what we're already seeing, I, I assume, will continue to be true, that people with with wealth, to some extent, will be able to protect themselves from some of the worst consequences. So there's this clear equity dimension that is an is a important reason to act and an important part of the dynamics of climate change. But we also know that, that climate change touches pretty much everything about our lives. So, for instance, a big portion of the Midwest of the United States was flooded for the spring planting season this year. That has an effect on the well-being of farmers, then it ripples out into their communities. It has the potential to ripple into food prices. So I pick that just as, as one example. There's the direct impacts of climate change, and then in complex systems, there's the way that impacts cascade upon you know one, one after the other. What the particular risk is, of course, depends very much of, on the part of the country that you're in. People near the coast are concerned and already experiencing effects of sea level rise and stronger tropical storms and flooding that comes with that. Many urban areas around the country are already experiencing harder downpours. And so they're having stormwater flooding, which is, you know, damaging people's homes and businesses, flooding the streets and things like that. And there's there's then changes in patterns of precipitation. So we've been talking a lot about flooding, but other places are at risk of, of drought. So there's not one simple impact for a country as large as the United States. But there aren't very many places that are expected to not feel any impacts at all. And then, of course, as we start to think about places becoming less livable and there being a retreat from areas that are the most risky, there will be things like waves of migration and refugees from climate change that are going to have their own effects on our systems and put stresses on different different parts of the country. We're already having that with um, migrants at the southern border who are uh, leaving countries that are affected already by climate change. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, another thing that some people who work on climate change talk about it as, as being a multiplier or an added stress onto other stresses that already exist. So, I think few refugees at the southern border would name climate change as the only reason that they left their homes. Some talk about it being harder to grow food. Others talk about political instability or violence. And of course, all of these things interact in all of our lives. We talk about it as a, as a complex system, but generally increase in temperature means increasing stresses on all the other aspects or many other aspects of systems too. Can you just explain or give some examples of how feedbacks and tipping points work and what they are? Mm -hmm. Well, in some parts of the climate system, there's the potential for warming to start to feed upon itself. And so often when climate scientists talk about tipping points, that's the sort of thing they mean. One example is the fact that at the poles, white ice is reflective, and so the energy from the sun radiates back out to space more than when it gets absorbed by darker ocean water. So you have a cycle where with warming, there's less ice, so there's more absorption of heat, which means even more warming. So anytime a change in one direction creates more change in the same direction, that's a, f a feedback loop that can be a tipping point where it can start to carry on actually in a way that's independent of human activity. So 
our burning of fossil fuels might have kicked that cycle off. But at some point, even if we were to stop burning fossil fuels, that cycle might carry on on its own momentum. And and so for human beings who are trying to keep a planet within a certain set of parameters that we've been adapted to, that's a big danger. It's hard to know exactly where tipping points will be encountered or how strong they will be. So that when people talk about the uncertainty around climate change and why um, it's important to act as early as possible, tipping points is part of, of that rationale for early and very, very strong and committed action. I wanted to ask you, before we talk about multi-solving, I wanted to ask you, I watched your TED Talk, where you, which you illustrated with photographs of your children. I wanted to ask you, are you personally afraid for your children or grandchildren? Well, that's a good question. You know, the words that come to my mind more than afraid are, are just responsible. My generation, so I'm in my early 50s, my generation happens to be the one that is now at the helm of a lot of positions of power. I'm the co-director of an organization. People my age are senators or CEOs. We're the ones who are steering systems that could make an enormous impact on future generations, my children and you know, many generations beyond that. So a sense of responsibility for the ones who have influence at this moment in time in this really shrinking window of opportunity to act. You know, the world has been galvanized by Greta Thunberg and and her peers. And, And part of what they're saying is that they don't have time to grow up to become politicians and prime ministers to do what needs to be done. That's why they they're asking our generation to act. So it's responsibility that gets me, you know, out of bed every morning and working as hard on this as I can. That's how I think about it. And do you realistically think that all the governments of the world are going to act in time and at the scale that's necessary? I don't think that's the question that I find the most helpful. I think it's clear right now we don't have the conditions in the world where the governments have the ability to do what's needed. And that means they don't have the support of their population or the pressure from their population. They don't have the media making the case every day. They don't have the media linking climate impacts to their root cause in the burning of fossil fuels. Governments are under pressure from the fossil fuel industry, which stands to lose some of its wealth and influence if we do what's needed to be done on climate change. So Rather than asking, do I think the governments are going to do what's needed, I'm really focused on how do we change the conditions so that the governments do do what's needed. And um, so can you tell us what multi-solving is that I think your organization has developed this idea of change on a number of fronts? Yeah, we're, we're certainly not alone in talking about the importance of this idea, which is just to apply what we think of as a systems view to thinking about climate change. A narrow view of climate change would really focus on its direct causes, greenhouse gases, so CO2 and other gases like methane and nitrous oxide, and to really focus all of our attention on what can we do to reduce those greenhouse gases. And we think we call that sometimes a carbon centric viewpoint. And it really leads to the kinds of technological changes that are needed. But we think that a more productive view is to not lose sight of greenhouse gases. They're completely important in our predicament that we're in. But to broaden that with the question, what would be what else would be different in a world that had tackled climate change? And when you start to dig into that, you discover things like, while a world that had tackled climate change would burn far less coal. And if you look at the public health literature, you start to see all the ways in which air pollution, to which coal is a massive contributor, impacts our lives. It contributes to respiratory diseases like asthma asthma and cardiovascular disease. Even air pollution is connected to things like premature birth and stroke. Um, People miss days of work and school, so there's an economic drag from air pollution. Uh, A world that had tackled climate change would have also solved some of those challenges. 
Another example, if you think about our transportation sector, a world that had redesigned its cities to reduce greenhouse gases would have also created much safer ways for people to move around on foot and on bicycle. There'd be, you know, safe bicycle infrastructure, for instance, separated from cars. The public health literature shows that when it's easier and safer for people to use what they call active transportation, then diseases that are associated with a lack of physical activity, obesity and different chronic diseases start to decline. And those are a huge cost center in our lives. I mean, personally, um, people die earlier than they otherwise would have. So there's a personal toll on families. There's the economic toll on our health system. And so when when you start to enlarge that that view, you start to see things like what the World Health Organization said a little over a year ago. They said that the cost of being on a path to meet the Paris Climate Agreement targets, that cost would actually be offset by the global health savings of making those changes. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand, that the potential savings are of the same uh, sort of order of magnitude as the costs of being on a climate safe path. Are there any other examples of multi-solving that you can think of, concrete illustrations? Yeah, we in fact have have studied these examples around the world. So another one I'll tell you about is one of my favorites comes from New Zealand, where a program was started to improve the energy efficiency of people's homes. So things like better insulation and windows and more efficient boilers. But the thing they did that was unique in this program is that doctors could actually refer their patients to this program. So like instead of take two aspirin and see me in the morning. It's like, go get some new windows and insulation and better doors. And when they studied this program, what they found was that because the quality of people's housing improved, particularly people who were struggling with respiratory illnesses, their health improved and they saw fewer hospitalizations and less medical expenses. And so a program that reduced greenhouse gases because homes were more efficient, so they were wasting less energy, they were wasting less energy, was also producing a savings on the medical side. And it was producing a savings for families, many of whom were on a fixed income, who saw their energy bills go down. So you can see at least three types of benefits. Another one was providing good jobs for people in the construction industry in New Zealand. You have an economic benefit, you have a health benefit, you have an energy benefit, and you have a savings benefit for families. And I think you also talked about green walls in Japan. Yeah, so that is another fascinating example. And it shows another thing we noticed about multi-solving, that often these projects are spurred by a crisis, and it's not always a climate crisis. In New Zealand, the, the genesis of that project was a downturn in construction after the global financial crisis. And the, the first impetus for that project was to get construction workers um, back to work. And then only later did they understand the health and climate benefits. In Japan, the crisis was the Fukushima um, nuclear disaster, which led to an energy crisis as they turned down the nuclear generating capacity across the whole country. They, ha- they didn't have enough energy to meet all their demand. So there was a big push toward energy efficiency in Japan. And one of the things that came out of that was these green curtains that you're talking about. So green curtains are vegetative walls made of vines that go on the sunny side of buildings. So they protect the buildings from direct sun, which means they stay cooler, which means there's a lower need for energy for cooling. So that helped with the energy crisis. But again, whenever you're using less energy, if that energy comes from fossil fuels, it's also a climate solution. If you see pictures of these vines, and and you can go to our website, and there there are some, they're just really beautiful to walk by. And then the other cool thing about this project was that they chose vines that produced food crops. And so the, the products of the vines were actually brought into the company cafeteria and were part of the nutritious food for the workers in the factories. So again, you have a, a health benefit, you have a beauty benefit, you have energy savings and a climate benefit. And in this case, with an incredibly simple innovation. And the early inventors of this technique in Japan wrote down really simple sets of guidelines, and it was the innovation that rippled across across Japan. And my understanding is these are fairly common now. Wow, that's really interesting. 
Is there anything else you wanted to uh, talk about that we haven't mentioned? Well, I guess the, th the thing I would maybe end with is to say that once you take this multi-solving perspective, what you realize is that all of us, really no matter what our skills or our profession or where we find ourselves placed, have an opportunity to bring a climate lens into what we do. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think that factory workers in Japan had an obvious avenue um, toward energy efficiency, but they figured out a connection. And we see that over and over again, whether it's another program we studied was nurses in hospitals in the United Kingdom doing an energy efficiency program. Another was teachers and city planners and parents working together to make it safer for children to walk to school. On and on and on, I would just say almost no matter where people find themselves placed, ask if they can ask themselves, what's some problem we're facing, like a downturn in the economy or kids who can't find a safe way to school? What's a problem we're facing that we could solve in a way that also solves or addresses climate change at the same time? Once you, once you have that vision, you may need to build a wider network of people to go about doing it. Multi-solving projects are usually not solo operations, they're collaborative, but they usually start with, how can we address climate change and solve another problem at the same time? That's great, thank you so much. Absolutely. That was wonderful, thanks Beth. Okay, take care, bye. Okay, bye-bye. This podcast has been a production of Extinction Rebellion New York City. We have no advertisers. We are volunteers fueled by love and rage. If you would like more information about Extinction Rebellion, please visit us online at xrebellion.nyc. That website address is also in the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening and see you online until we can see you in the streets.